go through travel. And our company specializes in education, research, and development for destinations, for travel suppliers, and for travel sellers. And so we provided much needed um, objective research training and representation for travel trade. Okay, nice. And um, you have a journal as well, is that correct? We do, we have a website called the Wellness Travel Journal. It was designed to really reach out to the wellness traveler. It's a B2C platform. We also have monthly newsletters that go out um, covering any type of wellness travel news from doing well, looking good, people thinking well. Uh, yeah. We look at wellness in a very holistic manner. So it's not just about fitness and diet. It's also about emotional and psychological well-being, work-life balance, happiness, productivity, all different aspects. Excellent. And I see um, our next panelist, Robin Shirley, has joined in. Hi, Robin. Hi, how are you guys? Good morning. Um, we're waiting on uh, Stefan, who was going to be our first guest, but um, because he seems to be having a little trouble dialing in, so we, we have just launched right into the wellness side of things. So for our uh, viewers today, we are um, now with Camille Hoheb, who is the president of Wellness Tourism Worldwide based in Los Angeles. Hi, Camille. Hey there. And we've got Robin Shirley, who is the producer of the Take Back Your Health Conference, also located in Los Angeles. Hi, Robin. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Um, and I just would like to let um, everybody who's watching today know this is our very first food travel uh, talk, and um, I'm really excited to be bringing it to our community. It's something that I think we've wanted to do for a long time and um, didn't really have the, the technology that was reliable enough to, to do it until uh, we discovered this, this uh, new webinar and meetings vendor who we're very, very pleased to be working with, and their technology is really solid, really reliable, and we thought, well, you know what? Now we can finally do what we've wanted to do for a couple of years. So uh, thank you both for um, agreeing to be our first guests. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having us. Sure. Um, okay, so we're going to shift the um, agenda and, and have Camille and Robin on first. So Camille, you were telling us a little bit about your company. Can you explain for um, the folks uh, who, are, who are listening today, um, what, what is wellness to you and how does um, wellness tie into the whole food tourism uh, area? Sure. So wellness really is a lifestyle and it has to do with quality of life, happiness, and the way that you lead your life so that you are engaging with the world in a way that is reciprocal and positive. Wellness travel is a part of, of course, wellness is a part of wellness travel and Gone are the days when people have thought about wellness, as I said, just in this, these two um, lenses of fitness and diet. So it includes emotional well-being, psychological well-being, uh, intellectual well-being, spiritual well-being, environmental well-being. And when you look at wellness travel, there are some different de definitions. Some are very basic, like traveling to improve well-being in mind, body, and spirit. And I think that's a good starter. But we looked at it in a way that's much more comprehensive. Um, we looked at motivation theory, achievement theory. We looked at wellness concepting. And what is really important for us in our version of our definition of wellness travel is that it speaks to the level of engagement with also the community where the individual is visiting. So for example, valuing and protecting cultures, nature, healing traditions, and we feel that wellness tourism is for the core, core healthy lifestyle traveler, so it's very purpose-driven, and it speaks to connectivity and transformation, and those are some of the key elements. So you talked about protecting cultures, and I think that that is a, a very clear link to food tourism because that's one of the one of our goals as an association is to preserve and protect those local culinary cultures. So whether you're looking at it from a cultural perspective or the wellness perspective or the cuisine perspective, you're still protecting culture. Well, absolutely, and food is also relational. So there's many different ways of looking at the – synergy between food and wellness. And if you look across the whole spectrum of suppliers from airports, 
airlines, lodging, they've changed the way they're doing business because they want to attract the healthy lifestyle consumer. And they realize there's a real problem on our hands with the level of obesity. If you look worldwide, uh, you know, as an, and I always look at statistics for the World Health Association, the problem of obesity is so huge that, for example, in the U.S., a third of our population is already obese. We're projected to be obese. That number is supposed to increase to 50% by 2030. Why so, still 50? Let's aim for 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not, the only, we're not the only country that has this problem. Mexico, astonishingly, astonishingly is already there. They're already at 50% obesity rate. Wow. So, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I find is really interesting is most of the world's population live in countries where obesity is such a problem and being overweight is more of a problem contributing to death than being underweight and being malnutrition, having malnutrition. That's, so, that's phenomenal. I mean, yeah, that's, it's, just to know that, that's amazing. Um, and I think for the people who are not based in the United States, because we always want to make sure that we're representing um, multiple perspectives, you know, when I travel, I see obesity um, increasing everywhere else. You know, I, the UK um, it seems like it's, it's on the, the uh, rise there. Uh, I was just in Spain uh, last month, and um, thankfully, I didn't see that much obesity. But like you said, Mexico, um, I know in the Pacific Islands, it's a problem as well. Yes. And um, I've seen in Australia and New Zealand. Um, I wonder if this is a um, more of a Western. Well, no, if the Pacific Islands, no, and, and places in Africa too. I mean, it's it's really a global problem, isn't it? It's definitely a global problem. Yes, and it has to do with the way that our food is produced and packaged and distributed. So yeah. it's it's a worldwide issue. Yeah. Well, I think that um, as the association, I said, you know, we try to preserve and promote local food cultures. I think that um, preserving those original food ways and helping to give them a, a crutch to stand on and a crutch to market themselves and to compete against the larger corporations. I'm not saying larger corporations are bad at all. I, you know, they have some very good things for, for people. But um, many times when you take that, that food and process or manufacture it, at, you know, just the act of processing it takes out a lot of the, the vitamins and, and minerals and, and nutrition. And in fact, um, I read something that uh, the, the food, the, the fruits and vegetables that we're eating today are maybe one one hundredth of the nutrition that they had a hundred years ago. Do you know anything about that? I don't, but I, you know, I think Robin may, may know something about that. And Robin's and, smiling. I think she knows about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and she probably wants to jump in about some of the speakers that were at our conference because they were really um, stellar speakers speaking about this issue, especially I was impressed with primal pastures. Robin, do you want to give some thought to that? Sure. Um, I'll just let everyone know I – uh, struggled with autoimmune disease from a very young age. So that's why I'm passionate about wellness at this point. Um, I was able to recover a great deal just through changing what I was eating. And so I, I started a company called Take Back Your Health. And um, it's a conference that happens twice a year in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. So what Camille is talking about are some of the speakers that we just had at our Los Angeles conference last weekend. And uh, what's happening is that the way that we are farming, the way that our agriculture system works, is it, it depletes the soil um, very rapidly. Plants obviously extract nutrients from soil as they grow. And so when you're when you're relying on an agricultural system to feed society as opposed to hunter gathering, which we used to do, um, you have to be very responsible in that agriculture system to rotate crops and put nutrients um, back into the soil in a natural organic way so that the plants that we are then growing next will have nutrients to absorb. Um, the problem that we're having is that we aren't, we aren't growing crops in a responsible way and, and we aren't, replenishing the soil through crop rotation and through um, composting the way that our ancestors used to take care of the land and take care of the soil. So a lot of our food that we're growing, it just doesn't have the nutrient resources in the soil that it used to. So a lot of the food then is obviously depleted as well. Yeah. I'm wondering, um, 
from a tourism perspective, are there other countries that are still doing a really good job with their agriculture? And because I know that sometimes when people talk about food tourism, they think agritourism or they think gourmet tourism, and, and there's some confusion there. Um, and agritourism is, is, is literally the, the farming perspective of things. So sometimes food travelers want to go to farms and, and look at things and, and look at new fruits and vegetables, taste them. Uh, oftentimes people are amazed to uh, see how, how food is grown. I mean, I remember um, when I was in Spain last month seeing how the, the rows for crops were were tilled, it was completely different than the, the big mechanized process we would use in the United States. So um, do you know of any countries where they're still doing a really good job at protecting their agriculture? Um, well, what, maybe Camille knows too, but I, I do know that um, I think New Zealand has a really strong, um, healthy agriculture system and they pay attention to these things. Um, I know, I would more know particular farms um, in different countries, not necessarily a whole entire country that was um, doing this. So I know people will travel, like you said, to go visit farms. I know of a few on the East Coast, especially um, the East Coast of the United States, but I don't know of any country in particular other than New Zealand that stands out in my mind. You make a good point. I think that it really is probably on a per farm level. I mean, there are there are big, massive industrial farms in every country, and there are smaller, more micro farms. And, uh, you know, I know, for example, we have a coffee producer in Portland, and he has a plantation in Tanzania. And so he was talking about what it's like to grow coffee there and working with the locals and so on. And that is not a, a large mechanized farm. Same thing in Ecuador. Um, I met with chocolate producers there, and you know, it's just it's it's pretty much you know it's either family businesses or um, community businesses. You know, they had uh, some people from the um, the An uh, Amazon side of Ecuador who were uh, sampling products, and those things are are um, efforts done by villages. Uh, a lot of community um, agriculture support. One of them was a um, for women, a woman's um, business program to get more women involved in the agriculture and in business specifically. So I think, yeah, it probably is at the, at the per um, farm level. And so I think a lesson then for uh, a food traveler or a food tour operator would be to try and um, ask those questions in advance, especially if it's a farm you're not familiar with, to make sure that it's the kind of place that accurately represents. But then, you know, you have things like Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream Factory in Vermont, which, you know, that's a big production, and people love Ben & Jerry's, so what do you say to something like that? Oh, in terms of people traveling to go to the factory and experience uh, the Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream in person, um, there's, you know, there are so many companies are doing, Ben and Jerry's does a lot of good work socially, I believe. And they're also really big on, on organics and non GMO, although not all of their products reflect that. And, um, I would like to see more brands that are doing good things, offering travel opportunities for their customers and for their fans. I know, like for example, Organic India is a, a very well-known tea company, um, especially in the United States, it's in every Whole Foods, and they work with uh, farmers in India who have been, um, I guess the best word to use is they've been tricked into um, buying GMO seeds and they don't realize what comes along with that in terms of having to maintain a pesticide um, culture. And so they bring these farmers back from being trapped in a cycle of GMO growing and they teach them organic composting and organic fertilizing and they're healing the land and they're healing these farmers. Um, their health has declined because they're around pesticides. Um, this guy just spoke, the CEO of this company just spoke at my conference. And I actually, like, I would love to go on vacation and meet these people who are farming for this company. Yeah. Um, I know, I know dozen companies that are doing amazing things like this and producing food products around the world and they're restoring the health of the land and the communities. And I think that's a huge area for tourism that hasn't been tapped yet. And maybe the companies just don't, it's not really something they're ready to offer yet. You know, you bring up a, an amazing point. So I pulled up their website so everyone can have a look at this. It's um, organicindiausa.com. And then um, under uh, um, About Us, it's Meet the Farmers. And so here we are. 
So there's Suresh with his big beaming smile. Um, here's Vishal. Um, I'm not going to try to say this gentleman's name and <laughs> Uday. Uh, I mean, this kind of thing where you know, I would, you know, this would be fascinating to go and learn, um, you know, see what they're growing. We had a speaker at our World Food Travel Summit in Sweden in 2013, uh, Gopi. Uh, he's from Kerala province in southern India, and he's very involved in agriculture there. So that's another resource for people on the call today. So, um, you know, food travelers, we, we can't eat 24 hours a day. We can't even eat, you know, 12 hours a day that, that we're up and, and doing things. So we need different things. So in between the, the great restaurants or bars and cafes that we visit, we need to visit things like farms or food factories or other cultural things like museums and so on. So here's some great examples. Mm -hmm. um, so Robin, th thank you for that. Now tell us a little bit more about your conference, Take Back Your Health Conference. So I pulled up the website. And as um, everyone can see, it was just held in North Hollywood. And uh, from all accounts, it was a huge success. Tell us about the conference. What, you know, what was the inspiration for the conference? Um, well, it, it really was my own health, as I mentioned. I felt as though um, there were a lot of things that I could do to improve my health that my doctor wasn't telling me about. And, um, and so I just kind of went on a, on a mission and did a lot of self-study and self-experimentation through nutrition and um, detoxification protocols. I did crazy things that I can't even, you know, mention on, in public, you know, just, to, you know, you're desperate at that point when you realize I can't live the life that I thought I was going to live because my body is physically incapable. And I was on, I was on the couch in my parents' house for, you know, 10 hours a day and then maybe I got up and I went on a walk or maybe I cooked myself dinner and then I went straight back to bed. It was um, extreme fatigue, extreme inflammation, uh, autoimmune arthritis, chronic Lyme disease and, um, and depression. And so Take Back Your Health is kind of this name that evolved once I got healthy enough to start teaching others and learning and getting an official education in nutrition, then I decided I wanted to start doing events. I wanted to teach people in person. And it went from cooking classes to one day retreats to a weekend conference and now four day retreats. And, um, and take back your health. It is really just a way for me to provide opportunities for others to come and learn from the experts that I learned from and be inspired by the same experts that inspired me to take back my health. So it's, it's really about educating yourself and realizing your own power to make some change in your life and not just relying on the system to keep you healthy. Okay. So, yeah, that's kind of everything in a nutshell. <laughs> okay, super. Hey, we're going to take a very quick break, and I would like to tell people about our Food Truckers uh, Consumer Food Travel Group on Facebook. So if you just go to facebook.com slash group slash food truckers, or if you search for food truckers in Facebook, there it is, and you can just request to join it. Um, it's already, we've launched it about a month ago, and we've got over 700 members already. Uh, we get a few new members every day. So please uh, go ahead and join this group on Facebook if it interests you. Tell your friends about it. We want it to be um, the biggest consumer group for food travel in the world. So there that is. Okay, so back to the conference. Um, so it took place over ninth, tenth, three days total. Mm -hmm. And how many speakers did you have? It was about 12, 12 or 13 speakers, and it was two and a half days. On the Saturday and Sunday, we focus a lot on nutrition, food, sustainability, um, detoxification, specific protocols, supplements, fitness, meditation, spiritual health. It, it's a big, wide range of topics under the natural health field. And then on Monday, we take it into the realm of, of more financial health and entrepreneur um, interests. So people who are interested in sustainability and health, and they're working on their own companies or their small business, and they want to learn from others who've been successful in that field. So it's kind of um, the first two days are for the general person who wants to focus on their own personal health. And then Monday is for the entrepreneur. Okay. And this is the one, so this is from last weekend. Uh, we're going to, we're going to be 
posting the new site uh, probably in two days, which will have the information for our Washington, D.C. conference. Um, and that happens October 29th and 30th. And it's interesting. We, we have, um, obviously, every year it's a different set of speakers and, and topics. And we've started seeing people returning year after year because we do different things. And um, someone came from Russia last year, um, which was crazy interesting to see that. But people who are really interested in this, who know it will help them, they will travel. So it's, it, you do see that with a weekend conference sometimes. Yeah. Um, but uh, but it is mostly local U.S. residents, uh, or so to speak, locally. You know, people <laughs> who are on the West Coast will travel to L.A. or people on the East Coast will travel to D.C. You know, you've given me an idea, too. We have a, a conference here in Portland um, called FoodWorks, and um, we're repositioning it for next year called FoodWorks, The One Thing. And you might have some ideas of speakers, either speakers who have talked at your event or um, even delegates from from your conference uh, we're looking for heroes, uh, seeking food heroes, people who have an important lesson to share, something that, you know, your own health story, for instance, you know, you came from a position of um, some severe health disadvantages, but um, it's these kinds of stories that we're looking for to um, bring to, to the world and inspire uh, our industry. So if you think of anyone, we would love to hear from them. Yeah, this looks like a great conference. I, I wasn't aware of this yet. Yeah, cool. um, every year, and uh, next um, February is going to be the fifth year, so fifth year, FoodWorks turns five, there's a little birthday right there. Um, yeah, and uh, so people who are interested in um, attending or speaking can just um, fill out this form here, and we ask um, people, I uh, see something is missing, oh, there it is, uh, you know, what's their one thing? What's the one thing that they want to share? So it could be a hard lesson learned, uh, their philosophy, a great story, that kind of thing. It's a lot of fun. We get about 250 people. How many people came to your conference? Very similar attendance. So we had 226-ish check-in throughout the weekend. Um, it's an interesting crowd in Los Angeles as opposed to DC. There's a lot of people who will come for one day um, and they have other obligations. And then so we sell one-day tickets, two-day tickets, and three-day tickets. So it's yeah. kind of um, a fluctuating crowd throughout the whole weekend. That's a good idea. Yeah, we've had people from um, maybe about 15 different U.S. states, about three Canadian provinces. We've had people from Portugal, Sweden, Australia, uh, and Korea attend as well. So it's just, you know, they hear about this, and um, they think it's fascinating. And how many years have you been doing this? This is... Uh, it's the eighth conference this past spring, but I've only been doing it for four years. So we do it uh, twice a year. Okay. And you did one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I saw the one in Tyson's Corner um, mentioned somewhere. This looks really like something I need to go to. Um, it looks really valuable. It, I think it's valuable for anyone. I mean, obviously, I'm going to say that because I, I want more people to be there. I have a, a vested interest in it. But uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable, the, the range of topics covered. And it, it's anywhere from, you know, weight loss to chronic fatigue syndrome, cancer, natural cancer options, um, prevention methods, thyroid and hormone health, um, healthy pregnancy, preparing your body to raise a family, how to sprout, how to grow kombucha, or how to make your own kombucha. I mean, it's all sorts of stuff, right. digestive health and uh, mental health and emotional health. So you I think... I think anyone can benefit. Have you heard about the Food is Medicine Institute here in Portland? Mm-hmm. Yep. They do a yeah. conference too, don't they? They do, yeah. And their conference is, um, they've just moved it so it's always around the FoodWorks time. So this year, it was the week before FoodWorks. Next year, I think it's the week after FoodWorks. Um, it, I think it um, tackles similar things. They have a professional track and then a consumer track, and they run them concurrently. And it, um, the consumer one is just Saturday, and the professional one is both days. And their topics are fascinating. Um, I think that they might get down the, to more of the, the science of it, especially on the professional track. I mean, I, they, I, I attend a couple of those, and this woman, they were talking about cells and, and how cells behave. And I, do you get to that level of science as well? Yeah, so it's kind of, it's interesting because some people really want more of that and some people 
um, aren't interested in it. So we do a mixture and we only have one stage going at one time because we're still in the phase of um, growing and it's a little bit too much to have different stages. So we put all the food demonstrations, all the doctors and all the um, experts on the same stage. So we would have, for example, we might do a doctor talking about the microbiome and how your food and, um, and probiotics interact or how the, the good bacteria in your gut interacts with your food. And they do get very technical and scientific. And then in the afternoon, we might have a chef doing a demonstration on, you know, some healthy foods with superfoods or how to lose weight or something. And then the next day we would have a trainer on stage that's talking about how to use food to, um, you know, get the most out of your workout. And so it's kind of, it's a, it's a wide variety of, of levels of, of, um, technical information. You know, it's interesting. You bring up this, um, this idea of this conference that you do in Los Angeles and the one in Washington, DC, we have ours in Portland. And I'm just thinking, you know, there seems to be an opportunity here for either, not just consumers to travel, like you said, the person from Russia, but even tour operators to package a conference like this with pre and post in the area. So someone could uh, plan to come to your conference, then maybe um, do some sightseeing in San Diego or Palm Springs, you know, and maybe turn it into like a 10 day type vacation. Uh, you know, this, this notion of traveling for conferences, um, I don't think it's fully on people's radar. Uh, you know, the, I look at our delegates from FoodWorks and it is like yours, largely, you know, local and regional people attending. And, um, I don't know. It seems like there's an opportunity to for tour operators to do a little bit more with this. I, maybe maybe I'm completely off base, and maybe they're already doing this. But it just seems like, you know, I would love to go to a conference. Like I'm going to uh, Peru next week uh, for the World Tourism Organization's uh, food. Uh, what do they call it? Gastronomy Tourism Summit. And uh, they are not doing a pre and post. But so I'm going to Peru for three days for the conference. But I'm missing the rest of Peru. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of a bummer, you know, because it's it's noted as being one of the most interesting culinary destinations in the world right now. So, you know, it, it would why why can't we do more in Peru? You know, why can't we uh, explore some of the countryside or go to some farms or talk to some chefs? Uh, you know, conferences that I attend just seem very you know very hurry, get through everything, meet people, got to go. You know, let me check my email on my cell phone, and and uh, I don't know. It seems like maybe if we could do more pre post with conferences, that might be, I don't know. What do you think? Are we onto something? Yeah, well, I'll say something, but I think Camille probably has something to say about this too. Um, I have had thoughts of doing, um, like pre pre conference, um, uh, gatherings where it's more, you know, the sponsors and exhibitors and, and speakers that might get together and then inviting the attendees for a sec separate ticket price, like the Thursday before we have a dinner. Um, the next day, maybe like, for example, we had a farmer speak at our last conference. Maybe he could do a tour of his farm um, on Friday. And then um, there's a group here in Los Angeles called Tree People and they are doing a lot of work with the drought that's happening and talking about how um, trees are actually one of our most uh, important protections against drought. They prevent evaporation. They hold groundwater. Um, they're actually, it's a huge problem in Los Angeles. I think Griffith Park lost almost 14,000 trees last year because of the drought, wow. and uh, which is an enormous amount. And these are statistics from the Tree People organization. They do work specifically with the trees in Los Angeles County. And I wanted to actually refer people to go do a tour with them at their facility. I thought it would be really neat um, kind of add on activity to the conference. What's the website? Talks, I think it's just treepeople.org. But I have this interest obviously in environmental health as well as human health because they're related. So that's why I'm interested in, you know, sending people out into the environment, looking at these farms, looking at the, what the tree people organization is doing. Um, but I think Camilla has obviously a lot of ideas about maybe what we can do in terms of turning it into a more well-rounded trip for people coming from out of town to go to conferences. Yeah. I, I think your idea, Robin, of visiting uh, primal pastures or some of the other uh, places, the other vendors or the other speakers is really interesting because what I seem to experience at the conference was that people were very passionate in hearing the speaker. And, and I actually really wanted to also 
visit uh, the farm in Murrieta. So having an opportunity where it's already prearranged or it's an opportunity where um, your attendees can take part in that, I think would make absolute sense. And then similar to you, um, uh, uh, Eric, when I was in Peru, I realized I was at a conference for three days and yet I might have missed um, the parts of Peru that I really wanted to see. So I think the idea of blending leisure activities and a, a leisure tour with a work-related conference makes sense. And we're seeing more of that in the uh, mice in the meeting space uh, so that it's much more meaningful for the person who's visiting um, the country or attending the conference so that there's more of a cultural immersion with that particular destination. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We, um, we're doing a big food trucking world event in Portland um, next year. And let me just uh, pull up that website. And that's in April. That's April 1 to 4 of next year. And we're partnering with the Willamette Valley Visitors Association to um, take people to the valley, uh, either before or after. We haven't decided yet. But we're, we're trying to do that. But I wonder, because when I'm marketing these events to people, People seem to feel like it's a, a burden to get away from the office for, you know, three to five days. And then they, they, they try to arrive as late as possible and they will even leave a day early. And I'm thinking, well, no, actually, let's, but is it because we're calling them pre and post tours and they don't sound really professional? You know, like it sounds like it's an optional, um, you know, you're going to have fun. You're going to sit on a motor coach with people maybe we need to call these something different to, to entice more people because the, the number of people, we've done these before, and um, you get maybe 20 people out of a conference of you know, 200 to 300. Why, why aren't more people taking advantage of these great pre or post options? I mean, the Willamette Valley is, is stunning. The wines are beautiful. So you know, the same kind of thing for your conference. You know, how can we get more than just 10 or 20 people going on a tour? What do we do? I have some thoughts for sure. Um, I, I this might sound this might end up being controversial, um, but I think well, first of all, there are th there are those who legitimately have scheduling conflicts, and and you can't avoid that. There are people who who have to be in the office, you know, at nine to five every day, and they have limited vacation time. So unfortunately, um, we have so many vacation options available to us that we have to be picky, and so some people might just not not choose to go to my post conference tour. But um, so that's one obvious reason the marketing issue it could be an issue it could be that your um, photos or your graphics here or the words that you're using aren't appealing to to more people um, but I think it looks lovely and it's maybe it, it just needs a graphical revamp um, but but more importantly on top of all of that I think that we have a systemic issue in our culture where we don't allow ourselves to engage in the activities in our life that are really going to bring us satisfaction. A lot of us, um, we, we get so distracted and caught up with the making the living. And I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir probably because everyone listening is, is really, you know, active with vacation and, and travel and they indulge in their life. But um, a lot of us still, we don't allow ourselves that enjoyment and um, and it's just a, a cultural thing. We feel we need to get back to the office as quickly as, as possible. Excuse me. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but those are just some thoughts. Those are really good ideas. I just, um, I'm sorry for being distracted there. I just heard from the other speaker. He had an emergency and uh, couldn't join us. So I'm sorry about that, but um, I'm enjoying the conversation. So <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is fascinating. Well, um, gosh, I am good. So when's your conference in LA next year, Robin? It will be uh, same weekend, April 8th, 9th, and 10th, 2017. Yeah. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So that will be just after ours. So if I'm not doing a post-conference tour in the Willamette Valley, I might just come down for yours. And um, Camille, I wanted to ask you too, because we didn't really go into this, but I know when people think of wellness, sometimes it's like in, when, in food tours and people immediately think of fancy restaurants and high-end wineries. And sometimes when people think of wellness, they might think of um, high-end spas and resorts. And can you maybe just comment on um, how those are part of it, but not the full thing? Oh, sure. It'd be my pleasure. So 
we've done a lot of research on wellness tourism and what we found out is that spas are a component of wellness. It's not the overarching theme in wellness tourism. In fact, most wellness travelers want to get out in nature, just as Robin had mentioned. They want to experience the local culture. They want to be immersed. They want experiences. But they also have a purpose. They're taking a trip for a purpose. Mm. And it could be for a a variety of different reasons. Um, Certainly, stress reduction is a top reason. But also reconnecting with themselves and reconnecting with others could be reconnecting with a higher purpose in life. So a lot of wellness travelers are emotionally driven as much as uh, driven for fitness reasons. So spa is really a a small component of that. Maybe 20% of wellness travelers actually visit a spa during a vacation. They're much more apt to participate in activities that are going to be fulfilling to them. And going to spa has its benefits. It's very pampering and luxurious. But past that particular moment in time, it doesn't necessarily add to their quality of life. So wellness travelers are really seeking purpose and meaning during their trips. Okay, interesting. Well, fascinating. Um, this is this is great information, you guys. Um, I'm really excited. And uh, I guess it turned out okay that Stefan was not able to join us, although I feel bad that he had an emergency. Um, so let's let's summarize here as we start to um, wrap things up because we're we're nearing the end of our time. So um, Camille, your websites are Wellness Tourism Worldwide right here, and yes. WellnessTravelJournal.com, which is more of the consumer side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yes. And then you've got newsletters. You do consulting for um, companies and tourism offices and organizations. And um, anything else that you'd like to tell about your company or what you can do? Sure. Uh, you know, the newest launch that we have is Wellness Travel Academy. And this was designed because there's been a real gap in terms of information on what is wellness travel and who can be involved and who are the stakeholders and how can it uh, boost your bottom line if you're a business. So we have, uh, we have a, uh, a suite of online courses and digital products aimed specifically at different segments of the travel industry. So, for example, we have one aimed specifically for travel agents. We have one that will be launching shortly for tour operators. Mm-hmm. And then we have one also right now for travel suppliers. So those hotel and lodging, which may have a spa component, but they really want to offer wellness in a much more meaningful way for their healthy lifestyle consumers. Excellent. So I see the one here for travel agents. You said you had one for suppliers also? We do. Uh, and that's actually an alternative um, website that I can be posting that I can share with you at a, at a later time. Okay. Okay. Super. But this looks really comprehensive. I mean, you've got 16 videos. Um, looks really well organized. It's only $297. Wow. That's a great deal. <laughs> well, we think it is. It's for a limited time only um, as we, uh, yeah. we actually change platforms. So we launched this beta in, uh, in November and we had a really great response. We had um, guests or we had attendees from all over the world, from mm-hmm. New Zealand, from Finland, parts of Europe, parts of Asia, um, across the U.S. And what we realized is there was such a demand for it, we wanted to take it to a different platform. So we invested the resources in a new platform that is specifically designed for online education. And as you saw, we have those 16 on-demand videos for the travel agents. But not only that, there is also some personalized attention. So there's an ask away component where um, students can ask their questions based on that particular class on a weekly basis and all of their questions will be answered. There's also recommended reading, which is very extensive. Um, We have learning objectives that are very clear and exercises that will help bring that person up to speed on wellness travel and how it can add to their bottom line, how they would market to consumers, Uh what are some key programs, what are the top interests, what are some of the top destinations. It's a very comprehensive program. It looks like it. It looks really, really good. Um, It looks kind of similar in structure to our Certified Culinary Travel Professional Program, but um, really, this is this is, looks well done. Okay, and then um, Robin, we've got your conference, and you mentioned the dates next year are April eighth to eighth, ninth, and tenth. Eighth to the tenth of twenty seventeen, and then your conference in the DC metro area is October twenty ninth and thirtieth. 
29th and 30th. Okay, and that's in um, the Tyson's Corner area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right outside of DC. Um, yeah, and then I do, I, I did mention, so the conferences are a big part of this, but the retreat is something that is actually more along the lines of perhaps wellness, travel, and tourism because I'm actually taking people to, to tourism destinations, and we are um, taking care of ourselves for a whole four days. I'm cooking for everyone. So it's very much tied into the food. This is a, a health food retreat, really, where you can hmm. be, be cooked for and experiment and live this nutritious lifestyle and see how your body responds over the course of the four days. And we're going to be in the Outer Banks. Um, actually, next week, I'm going to be flying out to Virginia and driving down there with a group of 15 people. Um, and it's all about cooking and learning to cook and experiencing the food in this beautiful place. Um, and then, of course, uh, on the West Coast, there's many places we could go to. I chose Palm Springs for our first retreat out here. And we'll be doing the same thing in the desert. It'll be a very relaxing, detoxifying retreat. Um, Healing through so, food. I like that. Yeah. So someone was asking if you don't, so I think someone was asking about the difference between wellness travel and medical travel, um, which is interesting. You know, medical travel is a whole different mm -hmm. topic, but this is really wellness. I'm so glad that you are doing this topic in particular where your main focus is the food tourism. But when you're traveling as a tourist and you're experimenting with the food in different cultures, what you don't realize I think a lot of times is you're getting food that is a little bit healthier. You asked me what countries are doing things the right way with their agriculture. In general, most countries outside of the U.S. are better than the U.S. because they just have more stricter guidelines on what pesticides are used. So in Europe, I've heard people who are intolerant to wheat um, in the United States, they respond better in Europe just because all wheat in Europe is you're not allowed to spray Roundup on it, whereas in the United States, they spray Roundup on wheat. Yeah. Uh, so just little things like that. Um, it's really important to note that when you're traveling and you're eating foods in other countries, you're getting their traditional foods, which is usually more healthy than what a standard American diet is. Yeah. Um, in Asia, I know a lot of people will they'll come across insects and um, chicken livers, and those foods are just more nutrient-dense um, by nature. So when you're traveling as a food tourist, it's interesting to learn about the little, the healthy aspects of what you're eating as well. Definitely. Uh, yeah. That's sure. the, you know, um, one of our delegates uh, today, attendees, was mentioning that Cuba has really good agricultural uh, <clears throat> processes and so on. And I think that, you know, that, that makes good sense. Um, I visited Cuba a while ago, um, and it is very much like stepping back in time. And, and I think that, you know, really the way that uh, maybe our grandparents did things, you know, the way the industry was back then, it was uh, more personal. Um, you know, people took more care and now it's more mechanized and it's easier just to spray than to do um, uh, like what we do here. We plant garlic around things and we'll, uh, what's, there's a book, something like um, Carrots Love Tomatoes, I think. Have you heard of that? And the whole thing, planting. sorry, go ahead. It was the whole thing is about um, plants that like to be next to each other. And because you do that, they do things like um, uh, they cross the nutrients. So they, they help uh, the nutrients with each other. They also help to repel insects. So you, if you have carrots next to tomatoes, they, there's something about the, the, you know, chemicals or whatever, or whatever it is, pollen that the insects, insects don't like. So it's kind of like doing natural, you know, natural, uh, insecticide control. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Uh, they do that. A lot of culinary herbs have the same effect. So they say, you know, plant lavender or rosemary near your fruit trees or, or different things like that. There's um, something called, uh, if I can just jump in for a second, and it's interesting because Weston, which is part of Starwood, has something called um, Superfood RX, and I think it's along the same lines of what you were mentioning, Eric, which is taking, um, combining certain synergistic foods together so that they have additional uh, nutrient um, uh, properties yeah, so yeah. that they're considered superfoods. If they were separate, they wouldn't have as much um, nutrients or, or, or be as healthful as if they were to combined together. Yeah. 
Well, I pulled up the book here. It is Carrots Love Tomatoes. It's called Companion Planting. That's the concept that, and this then we could open up a whole discussion about restorative agriculture, but I think we're kind of out of time for that. Um, so I would like to thank you ladies uh, very much for sharing um, your wisdom today to, to everybody. And um, so Robin's website is um, Take Back Your Health Conference. Now I'm losing, I'm losing things here. Um, that, okay, takebackyourhealthconference.com. But then if you go up here and click Take Back Your Health Retreats, that's the other website. Okay. okay. Super. And then, Robin, was there anything else that you wanted to share about what you do? Like, do you work with corporations or any kind of consulting that you might do? I'm doing a lot of um, traveling to speak and teach workshops um, for, uh, like, for companies or events. So I do a lot of that on the side. But um, the main focus is the retreat and the conferences. And then for people who, who can't make it in person, um, the third tab there, Club TVYH, which we didn't mention, um, is really an, like a virtual resource for people um, who want all the recordings. Um, I'm still working on redesigning this, but you can access um, the recordings from every single one of our conferences through the club, join the club, and then um, we'll have some more resources up there as well. Excellent. The mm -hmm. And if people want to get in touch with you, can they just use the contact us um, tabs on your websites, both of you? Mm -hmm. That's the best way, yes. Robin? Yeah, and my contact tab is all the way at the bottom, um, just in case anyone is having a hard time finding it. There it is, right there, contact. Okay, super, yep. great. Um, and uh, so let me just recap some of the websites we talked about. We talked about organicindiausa.com. Um, we talked about the treepeople.org. Um, I mentioned Food Works the One Thing and foodtruckingworld.org. We talked about the Carrots Love Tomatoes book. And we talked about the um, Food Truckers uh, public group on Facebook. And I think that's, that's it. This has been a fantastic first food travel talk. And I would love to thank you ladies both for, for everything that you brought to our audience today. Now for um, your uh, benefit and everyone else's benefit, uh, we have recorded the session. And um, as soon as it is produced, we will publish it to our new YouTube channel, which is Food Travel Talk TV. Um, you can't find it there on YouTube yet because there's no videos yet. But as soon as this video is posted, that will be the first one. And um, everyone who has attended today will get a link to that. And this will live in perpetuity. So you will everything you said today will be public record. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. Thank you both. And um, if anyone is interested in speaking on a Food Travel Talk TV uh, segment, just pitch us your idea. Send it to help at worldfoodtravel.org. Thank you all, and we'll see you next month. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.